Morning. We're back on Washington Journal with Anna Nelson from American University who served on the JFK Review Board established by the JFK Records Act of 1992. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for joining us. So how and why was the Review Board set up? What did you do? Well, Congress passed a statute in 1992 largely as a result of the Oliver Stone movie. Um, people had suspected the Warren Commission for years and years and years of hiding something. And then when the movie came out, large numbers of people felt that their, the idea of conspiracy had been truly proven by the movie. So Congress, uh, some members of Congress, feeling that they didn't really like the idea of having the government suspected of being part of a conspiracy, decided that perhaps it was time to not investigate but release the documents. We were not an investigating committee. We did not come to a decision on any way of who um, killed the president. It was our job to open every record we could find so that a large number of people can go use those records and make up their own mind. We were um, chosen by the president under the provisions of the statute. And the Congress suggested to the president that we be professionals who, rec who um, represented the two historical organizations, the two major historical organizations in the country, the American Historical Association and the Organization of American Historians, which is just Americanists, the archival, archival organization, the Society of American Archivists, and then the National Bar Association. One of our members had to be a lawyer. And one of our members was chosen by the president, who also chose a historian. So there were four historians and a lawyer. Now, I noticed on the cover of the report that you all issued, the statement, all government records concerning the assassination of President John F. Kennedy should carry a presumption of immediate disclosure. Is that a conclusion you came to, or were those your that, marching orders? Those were our marching orders, and um, that was the final statement in, the, in our um, uh, nominating committee. We, had, we, were, we were picked by the President, but we had to be approved by the Senate Government Affairs Committee, and um, those were the last words given to us. The statute also says, that we must proceed on a presumption of openness. None of these documents are closed forever. The, uh, they're closed for 25 years, which means in 2017, unless the agencies come back and protest, they are open. Even the ones that we decided, for various reasons, should be closed for a while. Largely, those were um, imposing on privacy rules, uh, threatening, we felt certain release of certain names would threaten officials, and um, and there were some technical operations that we had to cover. We were dealing with very high-level records. Uh, we were dealing with uh, not only the Central Intelligence Agency and the and the FBI, but also the National Security Agency, which is one of our most secretive agencies, and many other government agencies. Well, our calls have already started coming in. Uh, we're going to let you, we've brought some visual aids to show us the daunting nature of the task facing you. But first, let's, let's take our first call on the moderate line from Columbia, South Carolina. Good morning. Good morning. Yes, I'd like to know if Lee Harvey Oswald did not kill JFK, who did? Well, um, you're asking a question of who did it, and that's not what we were supposed to do. What we did do was to look into every corner for information on Lee Harvey Oswald. And we found a lot of it, and we found a lot that had not been released. Uh, one of these documents, for example, that one over there to uh, Deborah's left, um, was a document that we found that was totally black. And when it uh, was cleared for being open, want to get the other one, um, it, just, it said something we didn't know about Lee Harvey Oswald, that basically he had tried to go uh, to Switzerland uh, on his way to the Soviet Union. This was the kind of work we did. We did not decide on who killed the president. This report that you issued, is this available to the public? It, it's not available to public in that form because that actually is a copy that we had printed. The, GPO, the government printing office, 
is um, going to complete the report that we picked, the nicer cover reports, um, as soon as they can. It, I think it'll probably be another week or two. They'll be available for GPO, and um, they can be ordered from them. Unfortunately, our board is now out of business, so you have to get them from the government. However, I will say that the entire report is on um, a couple of websites. One of them is the Organization of American Historian website. The Washington Post considered putting it on. I don't know if they ever concluded to do it, and it may be on the National Archives website at some point. Uh, so we prepared a great many um, CDs, I guess they are, for websites uh, with the assumption that people who were not close to a GPA uh, a government printing office store or someone who didn't want to pay the price would be able to, to read the report. A uh, caller from Graham, North Carolina, on our conservative line. Good morning. Yes, good morning. I was wondering if the uh, commission or the committee there has received any photographs or any other documentation from the American public since the assassination to influence the report. And I was wondering if the new technology has made any inroads in finding out some information about the assassination that wasn't uh, revealed or reported in the past. Thank you. Actually, that we did use some new technology. Um, we were um, uh, graciously, uh, very graciously, Kodak offered uh, without my, uh, pay um, to enhance the autopsy records. Now, those records are still in the possession of the Kennedy family, but we felt like we were the last opportunity to clear up some of these issues, and that perhaps ultimately in the far distant future they would be available. They are always, they always have been available to pathologists and other people who would petition to see them. And so we did uh, enhance those autopsy records to the point where they are much clearer. We also assured that the Zapruder film uh, was digitalized properly and not just commercially. And we received a number of films and photographs. One was uh, taken by the president's friend, Dave Powers, who was in a car behind the president during the uh, um, ride to Dealey Plaza. Unfortunately, his film ran out before the assassination. But the film is very interesting anyway, because it does show the motorcade, and it shows it's really kind of tragic. It shows a very... Um, happy, cheerful president and uh, Mrs. Kennedy, and it's a, it's a valuable film. Then we also uh, obtained many outtakes from news people who um, had uh, published, you know, the, the newspapers don't take every single picture that, you, that the photographer takes, and many of them had saved those outtakes, and we obtained a number of those. So we have, I guess, we have enhanced greatly the uh, visual side. Uh, we made a plea for film and photographs, and we did get some that had been put away. On our liberal line from Chicago, Illinois, good morning. Good morning, how are you? Fine, thank you. My question is, uh, now that you've done the research and opened up uh, these areas, was it, what was the most surprising thing you found, and what is the next step? Well, I suppose the next step is for uh, people who are truly interested, and those people who have, in fact, spent many, many hours and days and months and years of their lives investigating the assassination, to now go to the National Archives. Uh, their finding aid, or our finding aid for these documents, is again on the web. And um, I think that's the next step. The next step has to go, come from historians and researchers. As in terms of what we found that was most surprising, I think the first thing was the sheer number of documents. Four million pages are now in the archives. Now, we did not look at all of that. We were instructed only to look at those documents that the agencies were covering up, either in part or in whole. And um, so our job was to look at documents that, that looked like the black document over here and open them up. 
and this we did and we were responsible for about 60,000 pages um, that had not been opened being opened is so that I think that's the next step what was the most surprising thing other than the sheer numbers of documents was, I believe, the careful way in which the CIA and the FBI tracked the event after it happened. And um, I think that the way in which the um, uh, Lee Harvey Oswald was tracked uh, once they realized that they had uh, suffered some missteps, uh, had not recognized that he would be uh, an assassin, um, I think all of those things. I think what is not surprising is that we didn't find the smoking gun. That is, you very rarely find a particular record who's going to tell, that's going to tell you everything um, you really want to know. But you can put a lot together. I also would like to add that uh, we had a category of documents called um, enhancing the historical understanding of the event. And we tried to put the assassination into a context. So we opened a great many documents on Cuba, on the Cuban exiles, uh, a group of people that have traditionally been thought to be involved in the assassination. And we opened a great many documents uh, on uh, the uh, mafia that the FBI had, because they're another group of people who have often been tied to the assassination. And then we even moved into a few uh, years of Vietnam because of the suspicion, um, the part of some people, that um, the Vietnam, beginning of the Vietnam War had something to do with the assassination. And so we really did go into every corner, but we did not make any conclusions. On our moderate line from uh, Louisville, Kentucky, caller, you're on with Dr. Anna Nelson of American University. Uh, yes, you made a uh, uh, statement early on that certain documents were not uh, released to the public and that one of the reasons that there might be people who might, I guess, be embarrassed by this. And is this, is there going to be continued allegations that the, uh, the cover-ups continued because these documents were not uh, released to the public? Embarrassment had nothing to do with it. In fact, um, the Central Intelligence Agency was very happy to see us go out of existence because we did not, in fact, ever worry about embarrassment. I'm thinking instead of a person who was, for example, in Mexico in an embassy who was a double agent and whose family may very well still be there and who could be physically harmed. Um, that is the kind of name that we covered. We did make some compromises on technical activities, but one of our mandates and something we did uh, consistently was when we took out a, a word, we put in a substitute. It was either a, um, a technical, meaning an operational detail on the part of the military, uh, something that they still use. That was part of our statute. We couldn't reveal something that they still use. Or it was a name or it was the name of a CIA officer who had been undercover and was in a foreign country and had never been, um, uh, never said or admitted that he was a CIA officer because he had been undercover. That's the kind of name, and we would always put down name. Um, there were other instances where we also had, we have a little code that goes along with the documents that tells you what was covered. But, but we never covered anything for embarrassment. That was not a part of our thinking. And I have to tell you that there were five people who came from many different fields of history and law. And never once did we really disagree on what to open. That is, none of us stood up and said, no, 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 you can't open that. The only time we disagreed was when one of us wanted to open more when we would discuss whether or not the privacy interests, for example, were important enough, or whether this was really a technical operation that was going. And we were warned to consider, we were warned, I'd say at least once every three weeks in the first year of our existence, that we were releasing too much and that it was going to destroy American foreign policy, et cetera, et cetera. But all that's been in the archives for three and a half years, now four, 
and um, and nothing has quite happened yet. Well, Dr. Nelson, we have a great many callers waiting, but if you could just tell us briefly, you just mentioned the other uh, panel members, who were they? Well, our chairman was uh, Judge um, John Thunheim, who um, uh, joined us when he was Deputy Attorney General of the State of Minnesota. Um, and Kermit Hall, who is a dean at Ohio State University and a constitutional historian. Uh, William Joyce, who is the assistant librarian at Princeton University in charge of manuscripts, rare books. And Henry Graff, who was an emeritus professor from Columbia University. That's four, isn't it? And me. Uh, and I actually um, uh, teach subjects related to American foreign policy. On our conservative line from, I believe it's Louisville when it's in Mississippi. Is that correct, caller? That's correct. Morning. Good morning. Yes, um, I have um, a little bit of um, history in uh, forensics as well as uh, retired from the military as a military policeman. Um, and uh, I was in high school when Kennedy was assassinated. And I was just wondering, um, after all this time, why hasn't anyone come out and just flat out said that there is just no way that he could have shot Kennedy from his position with the type of rifle he had, with the accuracy that he had, with the bullet impacts that they um, ascertained from the angles, you know, it's just, it's just not possible unless he was Superman. So uh, have y'all done any further ballistic checks on this? The one ballistic check that we have done and is not quite completed, um, although we had members of our staff watching over the uh, first part of the study, there is a little bullet fragment left in the, um, that the National Archives has had um, in a box um, all this time. And the question was whether or not that fragment had any kind of um, a fabric attached. Something seemed to be attached to it. And so uh, finally, um, the archives, of course, did not much want us to disturb this artifact because it was used in the Warren Commission and they were fearful that it would be harmed. But ultimately, they agreed. Unfortunately, they agreed very late in the game. And you will have to watch the newspaper or the um, uh, archives announcements or something. I don't myself know exactly how it turned out because we have, we had, we knew it would take about until the middle October for them to actually finish the study. We, um, because we were not an investigative group, we didn't go very much farther than that. The single bullet theory came out of the Warren Commission. The House Select Committee on Assassinations in the 70s uh, said that it was impossible and there were two, had to be two gunmen. And you'll be very interested in knowing that there is an FBI document which says that their double agent in Cuba um, heard that Fidel Castro went out to try to, to fire that many times from the same kind of rifle and uh, couldn't do it and announced there had to have been another killer. At least that's what the document says. So I think that's a controversy that will um, continue. Um, and we did not find any evidence one way or another. We found no evidence of a second killer. We looked for all these things very, very hard. It doesn't mean there wasn't anyone there, but we didn't find it. So you didn't come away a conspiracy theorist? No, I didn't. Historians tend not to be a, a conspiracy theorist. Some of them are, but I think that we tend to see a lot of, of many facets to uh, a, an assassination or to any event. Um, I didn't come out of it not being a theorist. I just didn't. Um, it seems to me that one of the basic problems in tracking conspiracies is that conspirators don't write it down. And so when you track the paper trail and or even interview, they're not going to admit it on an interview. So generally, the way you put together a conspiracy is very tedious work in a collection of records, and then you make up your mind. And um, people disagree about conspiracies from 500 years ago. So 
I would imagine there will still be disagreement, but I think now you can sit there and look at all the evidence that we have accumulated. On our liberal line from Vidalia, Louisiana, good morning. Good morning. Uh, something has always puzzled me about the assassination of President Kennedy. Within a week or so after he was assassinated, it just so happened that my wife, my children, and myself were going through Dallas on our way to Fort Worth. We stopped to see where the president was assassinated. There was a lot of people around there looking, just sightseers, just like I was. On the street, it, they had four squares painted out. Squares probably eight foot by 12 foot. And then each square was painted. Uh, for instance, one of them was painted, President's car, first shot. Then the next one had President's car, second shot, President's car, third shot. What puzzles me is, and I'm not the only one that was there that, that noticed this, standing in these squares, you could not see the window where Oswald was supposed to be. You had to walk way out on this neutral ground, facing a building where Oswald was, you had to walk to your right. And a window, they had red tape and the outline of a man was supposed to be holding a gun. But you could not see it from where the, the squares were painted on the street. How could he shoot what he didn't see? Well, of course, that's an issue that has been raised. Also, the, di the distance from the book depository window to Dealey Plaza. Um, I, I know that in the years since Kennedy was assassinated, many of the trees had grown up. I can't answer your question um, because I didn't see it in those years. We did go see it before we really got into business and in the assassination. And, and I think everyone who goes there is struck with an, another idea, another facet, another view of things. I was struck with the fact that when I was on the, the street in Dealey Plaza, I thought the window looked very, very far away. But when I got up in the book depository, I could see the straight shot. Now, whether or not he could at that time, with the growth of the trees and, the, and other differences, uh, I don't know. Uh, we, um, that's an investigative matter. We had a hard time drawing a line between investigation and that was just not our mandate. But I think that's an interesting story. And I would imagine that other people uh, at the same time uh, must, have, must have wondered the same thing. Curtis, Ohio, you're on our moderate line. Good morning. Good morning. Michael Piper, author of Final Judgment, a book about the Kennedy assassination, asserts that there was a dispute between President Kennedy and the government of Israel over the furnishing of nuclear technology to uh, Israel. And as I understand it, President Kennedy would not do that. In this book, Mr. Piper asserts the Israeli Mossad of complicity in the assassination of President Kennedy. Have you found any evidence in your search? Uh, we found no evidence. We found almost no documents having to do with Israel. Um, I think that book is one of maybe 500 that are written about the assassination, or maybe not quite that many. I know that when I first joined the group, I, the board, I decided to uh, turn on the computer and see what was around, and I was astonished at the sheer numbers of books. Um, my suggestion is that um, he go back and, uh, or anyone interested in that, go back and look and see. Uh, I have no recollection of anything having to do with Israel. But you know, we didn't see every document. Many of them came to the archives uh, all completely open, and therefore we didn't see them. So um, going through the database and looking for that might uh, prove useful to you. Our uh, next call is on the website. Um, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm saying the wrong thing. I'm sorry. Our conservative line from San Diego, California. Good morning. Good morning. I, I kind of wanted to, my first question would be, sir, can we get some clarification on the website where this report is posted, uh, an address or something like that? And then my second is more of a statement. My second statement here is uh, I am a 
proud, not so proud, owner of an Italian man liquor Carcarno, built in 1938. My dad bought it for me in 1960 uh, for 12 bucks. It's the same weapon that was used, the same type of weapon that was used by uh, Lee Harvey Oswald. During the middle 60s, uh, I, I had fired the weapon, but then I got the chance to become a much better shot at the request of the United States government <laughs> and uh, got formal training in how to shoot a gun. <laughs> and uh, in 1968 was the last time I fired that weapon. And I took it out to a dump and I had the last ammunition, no ammunition left for those types of weapons anymore unless you want to reload it. And I still have it, still packed away, but I remember trying to fire off three accurate shots in a period of time that I've, I've forgotten. I've, that distance was three to 400 yards. I tried to make those three shots, and I'll tell you something, I couldn't come within three feet of hitting the same spot that I shot out, first bullet with. The gun was notoriously inaccurate. It, the weapon was, was very clumsy, had a very bad bolt action in it. In fact, it was so bad that I stopped using the weapon because many soldiers during World War II were killed by the weapon itself. Uh, the bolt action was so rickety that a highly charged powder uh, charge from uh, one, one uh, shell could blow the bolt out of the weapon and into back into your head. It was a very, very bad weapon. And then, and there is a, uh, the weapon that uh, he uses in the um, archives because it was part of the Warren Commission um, set of documents and artifacts. Um, and we saw it. Um, some of the men lifted it up. I didn't. Um, but I think, you're, I think you're right. It was probably all Lee Harvey Oswald could afford at the time. And uh, that is one of the greatest controversies, is whether he could have shot that many uh, times and hit accurately. And it's, um, it's unanswerable in terms of what we found. I think there will always be speculation about that. The Warren Commission started that speculation by coming up with what they call the single bullet theory. That is that there had been a lone gunman. And, um, and I think that uh, while the House Committee disputed that somewhat, no one has ever found, other than the uh, various theories, anyone who has come forward to say they participated in that. Um, so we're left with um, the fact that Oswald, we know Oswald did shoot. Whether he did uh, shoot all the bullets or not is a matter of um, great contention with everyone studying the way in which the president was hit. It, get, it can get a little ghoulish if you really uh, want to look at it uh, time and time and time again. But it has interested people greatly. And I don't have an answer to that. And I'm not so sure anybody does right now. Before we take our next call, let's backtrack a minute. Uh, what I was flailing to say incoherently before was that uh, this report can be found at um, the website for the Federation of American Scientists. That's www.fas.org. And I apologize for my incoherence. Um, our next call is on the liberal line from Vallejo, California. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, it's nice to see uh, something other than the impeachment. Uh, <laughs> Uh, you know, hearings. So, um, yeah, I, I was uh, somebody who uh, thought Oswald was the only person that, you know, shot the president. But, I don't know, after seeing Oliver Stone's movie, and I don't know if you want to comment on that, um, and investigating uh, what happened in the Bay of Pigs, and uh, the, I think it was the Louisiana uh, Attorney General that sued, uh, that tried uh, Clay Shaw, um, a lot of interesting things came up. I know that when Kennedy came into office that he shook up a lot of people. I know that uh, he shook up the mafia. I know Robert Kennedy was investigating them, and they had connections with Cuba, along with the Cuban nationals the, and the CIA. Um, and uh, he was so mad about what happened to Bay Pigs, I know that he wanted to disband the CIA. 
reduce military things. Um, and it just seems to me that this one uh, bullet theory just uh, just doesn't stand up. Um, and I don't know when all the other material for the Warren Report is going to be released. I know it's sealed until sometime after 2000, and maybe they'll shed some light. But uh, uh, from from everything that I can see now, I really think that there was more than one person involved uh, in the shooting. Um, I mean, if nobody can actually duplicate that that kind of uh, a shot from that window with that kind of rifle. Um, the other thing is, I don't think that Oswald was a super expert uh, marksman either. Uh, from what I understand, he was a radar specialist. Um, in Japan at the same base that Gary Powers uh, flew out of with the U-2. And that whole thing about him going to Russia and how he got back and all that uh, kind of goes into him being involved with the CIA. So uh, I'm, uh, I'm kind of convinced now that it's, it's a conspiracy. And it's kind of like to ask you, do you think that the other information that's being uh, under lock and key at this point, do you think it'll shed uh, some kind of light on that conspiracy at that time? There really isn't any information under lock and key except for the selected documents we allowed to be under lock and key. We opened all the Warren Report documents that had been closed, and we specifically were told to open all of the House Select Committee documents. It took us a great long time to do that. And you've hit on a problem that uh, has caused a lot of suspicion, and that is that every time we had an investigation of the assassination, we hid the documents. That is, everyone closed the documents, and so there was always a sense that there was something back there. Now, as for the Louisiana trial, it was a district attorney, Jim Garrison, who was the uh, hero, you might say, of Oliver Stone's movie, who uh, pursued Clay Shaw and took him to trial, only man who was ever tried for the assassination. Shaw was astonished, by the way, and um, in looking into that, uh, we, uh, we received some uh, documents from the district attorney's office and some grand jury documents. And um, the, some documents from Clay Shaw's lawyer and also a diary that Clay Shaw kept. And um, in truth, Jim Garrison and hence the Oliver Stone movie has been discredited by these documents. Garrison, if you, if you read them, you see he did not have a case. He had nothing to build it on. And as you remember, Shaw, I think, was the jury was out, what, 15 minutes, 30 minutes, something like that. Um, he simply didn't have a case. And um, for that reason, I think you can discard that conspiracy. Now, there's no question about the fact that the Cuban exiles were very angry at Kennedy and um, because he did not support them when they were um, going into the Bay of Pigs with air cover. And so we released a great many documents uh, about Cuba and the Cuban exiles and tried to put a lot together uh, for the uh, reviewers. Whether We never found a close uh, tie, but then, of course, as I say, you, you're not going to find it written down. The mafia was used. Uh, we, have, we found that out in the 1970s from a, Congress, from a Senate committee. The mafia was used um, to approach um, a Castro. Castro was the subject of attempts at assassination. But um, it's, and while we have released all of those documents, it really will be somebody, somebody's going to have to go through them piece by piece. But I think actually, if I came out uh, on one side or another, I'd say that I came out not really thinking that Oswald was connected to the CIA. Um, I think we attribute too much efficiency to these organizations. I think if you, um, if you live around the federal government or work in the federal government, you see that, in fact, they're not very efficient. I'm not quite sure how they get together on a conspiracy. Uh, and so, you know, the FBI and the CIA in those years barely spoke to each other. So I think that um, that's one of the practical reasons why there was perhaps not a conspiracy. But in addition, I think that um, you, while you had a lot of people who wanted to um, uh, perhaps kill Kennedy, um, assassinating someone is not that easy. 
and um, what we hate to think of in this country, or perhaps any country, is the idea that one mentally unbalanced man could change the course of history, whether it was by assassinating Abraham Lincoln or um, William McKinley or John F. Kennedy. And that's what happened. That is, the assassination changed the course of history it was bound to. And so I think we really don't like to think that. We would prefer to think that there was some hidden uh, conspiracy behind it. There is no record that Oswald was used by the CIA at all. They had to scurry to come up and find anything out about him. If anything, they made the mistake of not following him adequately enough uh, when he came back to this country. On our moderate line from La Russell, Missouri, good morning. Hi, how are you this morning? Fine, thank you. Uh, I recently saw a uh, documentary on one of the networks, uh, or cable, whatever it may have been, uh, on some uh, private uh, group that have been investigating uh, the assassination, I guess, for some years. And, oh, my, back in my younger day, I was quite a rifle enthusiast. And uh, in this Zapruder film, uh, if you, if, I don't know whether anyone's ever noticed this or not, but you can see a bullet hit the curb on the left side of Kennedy's car. I mean, you can see the powder fly up from, from where that bullet hit that curb. I mean, it's, it's very obvious right there on the film. Now, these people claim <clears throat> that this assassination was set up uh, by, originally set up by a group of the mafia in Chicago, and that uh, it was actually done uh, through the French mafia out of France, and their concern and, and their reason for doing this was that Castro, of course, had nationalized Cuba and their casinos were losing millions and millions of dollars a day. And that Castro was slightly involved, but uh, that there were, there were actually three people involved in the shooting. And uh, the idea was so they could be sure that they actually killed Kennedy, that they were going to fire a, from above, uh, from the rear, above from the front, which was a grassy knoll. Uh, they have an enhanced a picture there that, that uh, pretty well shows uh, uh, a guy the, standing back in there. And uh, uh, the, the, uh, the other uh, gunman was, uh, was concealed in a, uh, a drainage deal down in the well, kind of street level. And he had an escape route that went out through some of their sewer tunnels or whatever that, that uh, it took about 20 minutes to, to get away, but they, he, they claimed that they stayed in Dallas for about 10 days in a safe house after that, uh, after the assassination, that they left there. From there, they went to Chicago. From Chicago, they took a uh, private plane uh, to Montreal and from Montreal back to France. And uh, I, I just saw this, but you can actually see the, the, the concrete puff from where this, this this one bullet actually hit the curb uh, across the, across the, uh, on the opposite side of, of Kennedy's car. So that, but there, there was a bullet that totally missed everything. And uh, this this one fellow that, that uh, supposedly knows has all this information is in prison in France. He was offered the contract to to, to do this assassination. And well, I think one of the one of the things you have to remember is that once there is a, a major historical event, a lot of people would like to feel they were involved in it, and so a lot of people have come forward. Um, I think that um, the whole issue of the grassy knoll and such is something that we um, will always have with us. Um, and again, my suggestion is that you go look at the documents now; they're there. I'm sorry. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Nelson. We're um, just about out of time. Dr. Nelson of American University was uh, a board member who issued this, one of the members who issued this final report on the assassination records review of John F. Kennedy. Um, we will be joining the uh, Congress as they convene in a um, weekend session to...
pass some spending bills that they have to do in the next few days. Thank you very much for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you next time on Washington Journal.